Go ahead. Hi, I'm Chris Clifton, and I'm here to give the first serious security seminar of the of this semester, uh, spring 2009. And what I'm going to talk about today is uh, some joint work done with a recent graduate, uh, Erjan Nergiz finished his PhD in December, and Maurizio Azzori, who is at the University of Pisa, K, uh, KD Lab in Italy. And what I'm going to be talking about is privacy, and in particular, how do we measure privacy? Uh, you know, what is privacy? Well, the ability to access and control one's personal information is a commonly used definition. Uh, privacy rights are recognized by several treaties protected by law. Many of you have heard of HIPAA, uh, the U.S. Healthcare Information Portability and Accountability Act. People often think that P is for privacy. Uh, uh, privacy comes into it, but that's not actually what it's about. Uh, European Community Directive 9546 and various others set standards for privacy legislation in the European Union. Uh, there are uh, nations such as Australia that have cabinet level positions of privacy commissioner. So one key thing is that privacy is about individually identifiable data. The privacy is concerned with data that is about you and that can be traced to you. But what does that mean? What does it mean for data to be individually identifiable, to be something that can be traced to you? Well, there's a lot of definitions and approaches to protecting privacy. Uh, obfuscation. We alter data in ways or, or add noise to data so, well, it's private because it's not the real data anymore. Uh, anonymity. Removing that identity from the, from the data. Uh, the key is, how do we measure these things? How do we measure, is, you know, have we sufficiently obscured the sensitive information or suffic sufficiently anonymized the data? Talk about some of the issues involved in this. So I'm first going to go through, you know, what are the approaches? What are the approaches to measuring this? What are some of the issues? And then I'm going to talk about our new work in risk-based privacy. So some terminology first. Private data, we talk about individually identifiable data, but we also will often talk about sensitive data. Why is this? Well, there may be things that are individually identifiable that are not viewed as sensitive. So for example, if you go to the Purdue directory, it's very easy to look up certain information about any student. That is individually identifiable data, but it's not viewed as sensitive. There are other things like your grades that even I as a faculty member can't get my hands on. Uh, that is sensitive. Parties involved. You know, people talk about the data subject. That's who the data is about. Uh, it, with most privacy issues, unfortunately, the person who the data is about is not who actually controls the data or you know, physically controls the data. So there is a processor that is handling the data. A recipient of the data that is, is, this data is disclosed to and an adversary who would misuse the data. And often these parties, you know, the recipient of a data may in fact be a potential adversary who would use the data in ways that, that you as the subject would prefer they don't. And the goal of technologies to preserve privacy is to try to prevent that disclosure at a level where the data can be misused. So what does obfuscation do? Well, the idea is to protect sensitive data uh, by ensuring that the recipient of the data doesn't actually see the sensitive values. They see something modified from those sensitive values. Uh, so you add noise to the data. If I'm trying to compute the average age of the people in this room, and everyone gives me their age, plus or minus 
10 years, you know, randomly chosen some, some number plus or minus, you know, between plus and minus 10 to add to their age. Well, if I take the average, I'm probably going to come reasonably close. Uh, in a much larger room, I'd probably get something very close because that noise would disappear in the average. The average of that random is zero. The, and what I'm getting is the sum or the average of the ages plus the average of the randoms. But if I ask anybody's individual age, hey, it's somewhere plus or minus 10 from what I got, but I don't know what. Now, one of the issues is how to use this data. There are specialized techniques to do this. So for example, in the SIGMOD 2000 conference, there was a paper, Privacy Preserving Data Mining, that discussed how to build decision trees, how to learn a decision tree from data to which noise had been added. It turns out that just simply learning it on the noisy data doesn't work too well. You can do a lot better. And the reason is because when learning a decision tree, you would need to know uh, gaps, you know, where, the, where there's gaps in the data. And those start to disappear. So for example, if there's nobody in the room who's between uh, 25 and 35, in a decision tree, I might want to make that decision between the young people and the older people. But where that break is would disappear once I added the noise. So how do we measure privacy in something like this? Well, the following year, so people looked at Agarwal and Agarwal's paper, uh, or looked at Srikant and Agarwal's paper, and said their notion of privacy and how much privacy they're getting doesn't make a lot of sense. And they came out and said, we want something that is much more intuitively reasonable. So their intu intuition was, hey, if I take and add a number between 0 and 1, randomly selected between 0 and 1, versus adding a number between 0 and 2, the first is going to give me half as much privacy. So I want a measure that's going to capture that notion. Uh, and then the second, if I have a sequence of random variables con converging to something, the privacy measures should also converge to the same thing. Uh, we won't get into as much detail at that. So what they proposed as a metric was to use the entropy, or actually two to the entropy, as a measure for privacy. Well, it's interesting because entropy we can define for any source of that noise, not just uniform, but we, but it gives us a good metric where we can compare it. And in fact, if I do say I have a, a uniform random variable between 0 and 2, this metric says the amount of privacy I'm getting is 2. But if I have, say, a, a Gaussian distribution to my noise, I can, it, it gives me a way to compare that that's meaningful. So, yeah, as an example, if we add noise from these two distributions, it would, you know, it would come out the same. Intuitively, it, we're adding just as much noise to the data. We're providing just as much protection for privacy. Okay, so what are the issues in this? Well, how much is enough? Well, it depends on the adversary what they're trying to do with the data, on the sensitivity of that particular data, on the individual. Uh, if we had one person in this room who was 80 years old and everybody else was in their 20s, uh, you know, adding plus or minus 10 probably would seem like it's providing a lot of obfuscation of the ages to the people who are in their 20s. The person who's 80, well, you know, so you're 70 or 90, it doesn't seem that much different. Uh, also, there's a problem with correlated values. What happens if you have age and birth date, and I add a random number to both of them? And I take one person and, and I happen to add 10 randomly to their age and subtract 10 randomly from the year of their birth. Well, knowing that 
this random noise came from a range of plus minus 10, I'm going to look at this and say, hey, there's 20 years between how old their birth date says they are and how old their age, age value says they are. I know what it really is. There's only one way that could have happened. So there are some issues with obfuscation. Another issue is, is there a legal basis for this? If you look at all of the laws, they protect individually identifiable data. Uh, if the individually identifiable data happens to be wrong, does that mean it's not protected? Uh, if you've got data out there about you, but it's incorrect, is that no longer a violation of your privacy? Well, that's, a, that's an interesting issue. It's one that courts have not resolved, and the legal issues really are, or the, the laws are really silent on this subject. Now, the other approach is get rid of that individual identifiability. Because data that is not individually identifiable is specifically exempt from most privacy laws. So how do we do this? Well, we can remove identifiers. I take away your ID number. I take away the name. I take away the address. Maybe I leave in the city, but I, you know, I take away the specific address. Uh, or perhaps I just say, well, it's on this block, but I don't say which house on that block or which apartment number. So your sensitive values are still correct and usable, but they can't be traced to the individual. Now, the problem is, how, do we be sh how are we certain they can't be traced? So say we take this data set, and diseases are sensitive. What we're going to do is we're going to remove the name. We've gotten rid of the, those, that unique identifier. We've gotten rid of the name. Well, the only problem is a lot of this un other information may be available. Suppose there is a directory of people who are in the hospital that has their, you know, that has their name, age, gender, and nationality but doesn't list the disease. Well, now you can put these two together. Uh, as it turns out, in the United States, you take such innocuous information as postal code, gender, and birth date, 87% of us are unique based on those items. Now, my guess is for 47906, most of the people in this room are probably not unique on that because it's, it, birth date is a, is a real killer there. Uh, I probably am, but students, uh, you know, there's a lot of people who are around the same ages in this zip code. But overall, 87%. Now, what's, it, what's kind of scary about this is for a long time in most states, hospitals were required to report information on every person admitted to the hospital. They were not supposed to report individually identifiable information. This was just general information for statistics. But they were supposed to include, legally required many states to include, the zip code that people lived in, their birth date, and their gender. What's more, you can go out and you can buy voter registration lists this is public information, and it includes your birth date, your postal code, your gender, and your name and address. Put those two together, and you have this problem. So, you know, that actually came out, uh, LaTanya Sweeney pointed this out uh, as an expert witness in a course case, court case where a newspaper had re requested these hospital admission records under a Freedom of Information Act request. And the judge, after looking at her testimony, said, nope, can't get it. Thank goodness. Uh, so what are some of the metrics? Well, Sweeney's response to this was canonymity. Canonymity says that I could have 
birth date, gender, nation in there, as long as there were at least K individuals who had the same exact values. Because then I can't link that record to any single individual. I can just link it to the group. What's a good value of K to use for this? Well, EC9546 says identified. What does that mean? Well, I was reading an interpretation by an official committee set up and came up with an interesting example where they said, well, if you have a town that only has one doctor in it, you'd have to remove the, the fact that they were a doctor or that data would be considered identifiable. What if there are two doctors? Sounds like k equals 2 would be OK. And from reading it, that seems to be what they were implying. Uh, but what happens if, say, there's three doctors and two of them are being investigated for malpractice? And you release this information saying there's three doctors and two of them are being investigated for malpractice. Well, I wouldn't want to be a, one of the doctors in that town, even the one who's not being investigated, because it looks pretty bad. And, you know, so it isn't clear what is a good value of K. The HIPAA safe harbor rules say if you remove the following types of information, data is deemed to be de-identified. And if you look at those quickly, you can say, well, it's probably a, gets you to around, you'd expect to be able to identify groups of around 100. Uh, US agencies that use K, things that, can, that look similar to K-anonymity uh, range from I've seen numbers ranging from five to 25,000 as what they feel is a safe number. Nobody seems to know. The other thing is it doesn't protect sensitive data. What happens if I have two doctors in town and both of them are under investigation for malpractice? I release that. It's not, I can't trace which record belongs to which doctor, but I know that sensitive information. So the a solution to this was discernibility, uh, independently discovered as L diversity, uh, which enforces distribution of the sensitive information. That within that group of K, the sensitive values have to have a variety of possible outcomes, possible sensitive values, so that I can't say any individual that I know exactly what the sensitive value is for them. Unfortunately, that can have problems as well because of skewed data. For example, say I was publishing something that uh, was database of diseases. Well, something that's very rare, it's going to be very hard to have a good distribution of that. Uh, T closeness, which was proposed by Ninghui Li and Tencheng Li here at Purdue, uh, enforces that the distribution of sensitive values in any group must match the distribution of the data as a whole, uh, which provides greater protection, but also is harder to achieve. So, you know, and any of these, it's still, you know, what is a significant, you know, what is a good enough value? What is good enough for this? It isn't clear. So what I'm going to do is propose a fairly simple model here and, uh, and then dis or a fairly simple problem and then discuss how this works. So here we see the problem, the difference. Adversary models, this is where you're trying to figure out the value of disease. You know the original data set. Canonymity in this case, to anonymity, would not be sufficient, not necessarily be sufficient. Uh, L diversity, T closeness would work. Okay, so some of the issues there, what is anonymous enough? Well, you need to know the sensitivity or the value of the data and what is the threat model? Why, what might somebody be doing? Uh, what about the utility of the data? 
we had an article in Data and Knowledge Engineering a couple of years back that looked at this, and it was interesting because uh, it, there, there was not even a clear understanding of what it meant for data to be good and useful after it was anonymized. There were some metrics people had, but they didn't seem to tie very well to actually trying to learn something from the data. And the third problem is efficient. How do we do this efficiently? It turns out that for the general problem of even can anonymization is NP hard, unless you place some fairly strong restrictions on how you can anonymize. Okay, so let's look at a simpler type of, of adversary. Typically in some, something like canonymity, we've been saying we know the individual is in the data set. We want to identify which individual it is. Uh, we're going to look at just a simple case of you don't know if an individual or not, is in the data set or not, and you just want to determine are they in the data set. We don't even necessarily need to identify which record they belong to. It turns out if you, you can think of this similar to the other problem by saying, well, I'll take each sensitive value and make it a different data set and say, are they in that sensitive data set? So these are all quite related. But it, just taking this very simple problem will make the rest of the discussion easier. Okay, canonymity provides some protection in all of these views, but not perfect. Uh, some of the extensions, well, what we're going to look at today is delta presence, which just handles this, is an item in the data set, but looks at this in a very new way, looks at what is the risk associated with learning that someone's in the data set, and how sure you are that they are in the data set, and enables us to come up with new ways for anonymization. So this work came out in Sigmod 2007. It's this simple model. Uh, the way you interpret this is the increased risk of disclosure. The adversary already has some knowledge. They know uh, my name, my birth date, my zip code. Uh, I make this data available. How much more do they learn? Uh, in terms of identifying whether or not I'm in that data set. And we've even, we can even work this out where you can talk about a bridge between what would the harm done to me be? Uh, you know, perhaps I could measure it, that harm in a dollars and cents cost. We can then convert that and say, how much do you have to anonymize the data to keep that harm below a certain level. And it may be different for different individuals. So here's a specific example of this. Say we have a database of diabetes uh, uh, sufferers. And we would like to produce anonymized data set for research. It has lots of details on individuals who are at risk for diabetes. The problem is, if we disclose this, well, insurance companies probably would not want to insure these people because diabetes is an ex treating diabetes is expensive and an expensive ongoing treatment. There's a known treatment cost. The insurance company can look at this and say, this is how much it's going to cost or how much they expect it to cost. So what we want is a probability of identification that if someone is in that data set, uh, the probability that, I, that an insurance company would be able to figure that out, or their estimate of the likelihood that I'm in the data set, would be sufficiently low that their expected cost would be noise. It wouldn't be enough that they would, would want to worry about it. And we want to do this on a per individual basis. So when I say per individual basis, uh, different individuals 
the insurance company may already know things that put them at a different risk for diabetes or, or a different expected cost. Or different individuals may need different levels of anonymization. For me, the year of birth and my zip code may be enough or you know, may be enough that they can identify as well with a 10% probability that's Chris. Whereas for a Purdue student, you know, that may, you know, year of birth, well, there's a lot of people born in the same year, uh, most of the people in their class, and so the estimate may drop way down. And you could say, well, for those people, we can say month and year. So what delta presence does is it's a definition that says privacy is preserved if the probability that someone appears, or, or the, the probability that an adversary's estimate of the probability that someone appears in this data set is between some upper and lower bound, you know, between delta max and delta min. Now, why do you want to have both an upper and a lower bound? I mean, you could say, well, you know, with at most 5% probability, you're in this data set. Uh, that sounds good, but what's, what's the harm in saying, well, I can say for certain you aren't in this diabetes data set? Well, as an insurance company, I'll just go out and say, I'm going to insure everybody whose probability of being in the data set is zero, and that'll give me more customers than I need, so that, you know, that's enough. So you may want to say, well, there's also a possibility that anybody could be in that data set. Now, the key, the adversary knows this public information. They see the anonymized data set, and they have their estimate that an individual, any given individual is in that data set has to be within these bounds. If so, you've met the delta presence standard. So, you know, here's an example of a, uh, of a data set where we have some publicly known data. And in this, we just put for illustration purposes whether that's someone that's in the, the data set. And right now, you can see it's pretty easy to match people up. We want to anonymize T to the point where someone who has P wouldn't be able to figure out if they're, if they're in that data set T. OK. So first, what are good values for delta? Well, there's, if I said you know, diabetes costs 10,000 a year to treat, and if an insurer has an expected cost of you know, of a, or, or if it's expected cost of a hundred dollars a year or less, they're not going to worry about it because, you know, their their expected profit's going to cover that. What would you say I should be setting delta as? The the probability that you could figure out that someone is in this data set, the, the likelihood they're in the data set. What would be your first guess on on the way to set that? So you've got $100,000 or $10,000 is the cost. A hundred is the expected cost that's acceptable. Well, what's a hundred divided by ten thousand? It's one percent, right? Yeah. So I, I come up with one percent, but that doesn't work out. If if I say what is the cost that someone or what is the likelihood that someone is either diabetic or at risk for diabetes? If I didn't know anything about you, what do you think I would say your risk is, your probability of being at risk for that disease is? Well, I'd say around 7%, because that's the incidence of it occurring in the general population. So already that estimate's around 7%, so saying someone's in the you know, the likelihood someone's in the database is only 1%, actually, you know, 
really is, is already lower than what I would think if I didn't know anything. So what you actually set this on is based on the, prob the prior belief and the posterior belief. Given what they know without seeing T star, the anonymized data, and what they know after, the difference between those has to be in the acceptable range. In this particular example, using those numbers, I, you know, using kind of some actual numbers similar to those I gave, we end up with between 0.02 and 0.05 as being reasonable, a reasonable range. Here's, a, here's another example of this, of why this might be, you know, the, the diabetes is one example, but here's actually a very real example. I mean, insurers who try to cherry pick individuals, you, know, you have to be very careful with that. There's insurance laws. But here's one that people who don't worry about the laws actually do. They target people with poor memory. They go out and they obtain medical record information and find people who have diseases like Alzheimer's, which affect their memory. You call the person up and you talk about this item they've ordered and they owe payment for. And then you call them up the next day and you say, well, have you sent the payment for this item yet? Well, they know they have a poor memory, but they vaguely do remember something about there being payment for this item, so they think they really do in fact owe it. Now, the first time you called them, they were pretty certain they didn't. But the next time, well, they're not sure anymore. And so they end up sending payment. The only problem is, if, you were to, if someone called me up and tried this scam, I'd look at the telephone number and I'd call the police and say, look, I think we've got a scam going on here. Because I know full well that I don't owe that money and that they'd called me the day before talking about it in kind of different terms, that there's something wrong here. So if you can lower that scammer's likelihood so that they're going to end up calling enough people who have good memories that someone's going to report them, you know, without getting too many people who have bad memories that they'll get the money from, then they're not going to try this. Okay, so how do we do this? How do we actually check to see delta presence? Well, it turns out it's, it's actually kind of, it at first glance looks kind of difficult to evaluate this. But in certain cases, it's fairly easy. And what this is is a non-overlapping generalization. If you can take a data item a tuple in that table and map it into most one equivalence class. Equivalence class is like canonymity. If there's at most one group that it matches, then it's fairly easy to check this. And as it turns out, most of our generalization approaches in things like canonymity do work this way. So once we have this, what we do is we put the items into their appropriate equivalence classes, and then we just look at the sizes of those equivalence classes. And are they within, is, is the, the, the public value is going to map into one uh, value in the anonymized data, or one group in the anonymized data, and we look at the relative sizes of those and say, is it between the numbers we need. So all we need to do then is check to see if the number of sensitive values in that public table, or the number of things that we can, can map to the group divided by the size of that equivalence class is within the range of delta min, delta max. So in this case, it would be 0 0.5, 0 0.66 present. You know, we have two-thirds in one group and one-half in the other group are, are in there. 
Canonymity fails in this case. Here is a five anonymous data set, and yet I can clearly identify some individuals as being in that data set. You know, every individual who's over 40 in that public table is in the five anonymous data set. So, you know, with respect to this delta presence measure, canonymity doesn't, there, there is no value of K that guarantees you meet this delta presence standard, that you're protected against this type of adversary. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, delta presence has a, or if we have an anti-monotonicity anti property, then it, it turns out to make it easy. Well, what this anti-monotonicity says is that if you have a generalization that is not delta present, then anything more specialized than that will also not be delta present. So if I start with the most general possible, um, okay, so if I start, let me, if I start with the most general possible thing where I've put everything in the same equivalence class, I've generalized everything to being the same, and say, okay, that meets my standards, then I can start getting more specific and eventually, I will be, once I find something that doesn't work, anything that is like that but more specific will not work. And so this gives me a fairly small space that I need to search to find my most specific candidate. So, yeah, this gives me an algorithm that I can use where I can come up with a, a valid generalization. Now, the difficulty with this is sometimes, in order to get this anti-monotonicity property, you have to say, I'm going to generalize everything the same. If I generalize age from month and year to year, I have to do it for everybody. That's how this algorithm works. What happens if I say, well, for these young students, month and year is okay. For us old professors, it has to be just year. Well, in that case, you need a different approach to an algorithm where you can actually go through and divide into groups, you divide into equivalence classes, and then each equivalence class gets generalized. Once it meets the delta present standards, then you generalize that equivalence class. Okay, there's some limitations to delta presence. First, what happens if the anonymizer the person doing the anonymization doesn't actually know all individuals in the world you know, that the adversary might know uh, that are in that public data set. Well, we actually have a solution to that where you make a slightly weakened assumption that you know a distribution of each attribute. You know, for example, what the distribution of ages are, but you don't know every individual's data. Uh, and then you can support delta presence with some known confidence. The difficulty with this is you can only come up with that delta min. You can't say what is the, you can't say that someone may, you know, no matter who they are, they might appear in the data set. And the reason is you may get individuals that are just so far out the expectations. You know, you get that one person who lives to 113. Well, you're going to look at this data and you're going to be able to say, well, there's no 113 year olds in this data set. I know they're not there. Uh, other algorithms?
Can we come up with better algorithms for delta presence? Can we incorporate sensitive data into this? How do we do this? Uh, we've, we've got some solutions for that. Some other things we've been looking at are modeling varying levels of adversary knowledge. So here's an interesting thing. Going back to this diabetes example, uh, say weight is in that one of the characteristics in that data set. Well, if I, in my public information, I don't have your weight, then there's some probability that I've identif I can identify you. But if all of a sudden I know your weight, there's a greater probability that I can identify you. But if I know your weight, my prior belief that you have diabetes also becomes more specific. You know, if you weigh 300 pounds, I can say, hey, you're very likely at risk for diabetes. If you weigh 150, I can say, well, very likely you aren't at risk for diabetes. So that information both helps to identify but changes the prior belief. And remember, what we're trying to do is limit the additional information given to the adversary. So the adversary, knowing the weight, may actually not give them additional information. That, or giving them the anonymized data may not actually give them additional informa information, or more additional information than if they didn't know the weight. Uh, also, how do we personalize the risk? Some people may suffer greater harm than others. Yeah. I'm a tenured faculty member here. I probably don't have to worry about losing my insurance benefits. Uh, whereas someone looking for a job, well, that might be, you know, that might be a little more of an issue. Uh, so I'm going to skip through this uh, C confident delta presence, just noting that uh, this is, you know, this, this is the definition. It's basically saying that delta presence holds with some probability. And that's where we know the distribution of the data. We don't know exactly what the adversary knows. Okay, so, oops, that was the wrong skip ahead. Let me just see if I can skip back to where I wanted to skip ahead to. This is a Okay. Okay, this is a just a couple of minutes I wanted to mention because this is an area you know we have some issues with anonymity and now there's starting to be some new things coming up. Uh, there's a new type of data that is becoming you know that is getting gathered and tracked and used a lot and that is data about moving objects. Uh, if you're carrying around a, a cell phone it is quite possible there's a GPS unit in there that is capable of reporting your exact location continuously and there's all kinds of neat things that can be done with that data. Uh, I saw a study here at Purdue where they uh, used Bluetooth identifiers on Bluetooth equipped cell phones to measure traffic and determine which routes out of town were the fastest after a football game. Uh, that's interesting. You, know, you really want someone knowing exactly where you are at all times. Uh, if you look around, you'll find you, it's possible to find, you can find a website where they're talking about showing people are showing locations of individuals in Copenhagen, I think it is. Now, they're not actually reporting who the individual is. They're just saying, oh, there's a person here, and doing this in real time, available over the web. Well, that might, you know, it's not individually identifiable unless I happen to see where you are, and then I can follow where you're going. Uh, it turns out that obfuscating or 
anonymizing this is a lot harder than you might think. Uh, you know, so here's an example. Suppose we have these tracks, and suppose we're going to make this easy. We're just going to release them as a set that is that we want to anonymize. Well, what might we do? Well, we can say, oh, we're going to k-anonymize them. They all look the same. Well, the problem is, that's probably not going to be very useful data anymore. So are there better things we can do? Well, perhaps instead of, you know, perhaps we can obfuscate the data, which makes it harder to follow. Or we can obfuscate parts of it. How do we measure the privacy of this? Well, this is an interesting proposal I saw once that they said, what we're going to do is we're just going to take a point and we're going to generate an ambiguity region around the point. And then we're going to shift that region so that the point is somewhere within the ambiguity region. And they said, well, the privacy this provides is pi r squared, the area of the ambiguity region. Is that correct? If you had to guess where the point really was, what would be your guess? Yeah, you'd guess the center. And that's a better guess than anything else. It's really not uniform using this approach. So a lot of things like this where it isn't easy. Trajectories you know, start getting even harder. Uh, you know, we can anonymize the metadata so you can't tell which track is which from, you know, we don't have the cell phone number attached to it. We can obscure the location so it's harder to see. We can anonymize the locations so that any individual points are the same. Uh, combine these, and now you look at this and you say, well, I may know where red started out, but I don't know where they ended up. So this is, you know, this is getting better. Uh, of course, we have to worry about time. Did these all happen at the same time? And there's another thing that starts coming into this, even if we use all those to obscure. I would guess, at this point, that that top right-hand point is not red. Because, well, it would have been a lot faster for red to go across the top bridge. They probably weren't going there. You start having to include constraints, because you can come up with things that are unlikely for an individual to do, even though they seem possible from the anonymized data. So anyway, there's still, this is, I've seen two or three papers now in anonymizing moving data. Uh, this is still a very early stage. Uh, lots of work left to be done. So there's, you know, defining, measuring, understanding privacy is a wide open field, uh, particularly when you start dealing with some of the new types of data that are being collected and people want to make available. Anyway, any questions? Comments, thoughts? Yes, please push the button on your mic so that the recording can uh, I'm, I'm a computer science student and female, which in any kind of survey of any kind um, really narrows down who I am. And so at the end of a class, they'll have a survey or whatever, you know, how was the professor, how was the book, how was the TA. Um, I actually was instructed to mark it male so that they didn't know it was me that was filling it out. Yeah, it's kind of, that's an interesting, yeah, that's an interesting point that, that, and that's where some of these come in is that, uh, that in different groups, 
different anonymization techniques are needed. And that's why things like delta presence become very necessary, is because you, you can't just say, oh, this is you know, one size fits all. Because in any, you know, in any room, there may be some individuals who stand out, but in some other group, they may, they may not. And yeah, that's, that's one we deal with particularly every day. Although it's interesting because removing that information of gender may be, you know, really lowers the utility of the data. Because one of the things we'd like to figure out is why do we have such a male-dominated uh, under, undergraduate population? We'd like to understand, are we doing something that is, you know, are there things that we do in our classes that are uh, somehow gender biased? We'd like to be able to figure out what those are. If we don't have the gender in, the, in those evaluations, it's harder to figure that out. But on the other hand, if we put it in, we violate privacy. So it's very interesting that these, you know, this trade-off between privacy and utility becomes very challenging. Any other? Yes. Uh, you, you mentioned that postal code, gender, and date of birth give you an 80% or 87% chance of uniquely identifying someone. Yeah. Um, what, when you said date of birth, do you just mean year of birth? No, that's actually the, the full date. Full the date, full so birth month, date. day, and year. Yeah, I that's think. really what's doing it there is, okay. the, is the birth date. Yeah. Uh, you know, and postal code. And you'll actually, if you look at the HIPAA safe harbor rules, they will allow you to have year and the first three digits of the postal code. Okay. But nothing finer grained than that. Thank you. So. Okay. Anyway, I will see you all next week. And uh, thank you for coming. I hope you've enjoyed this. And I look forward to seeing, those of you who are taking this as a course, I look forward to seeing you the rest of the semester. Those of you who are just here for the seminar, uh, I sure, hope, hope we'll have many others that interest you and bring you back.